of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 95 When they returned to London, Philip began his dressing in the surgical wards. He was not so much interested in surgery as in medicine, which, a more empirical science, offered greater scope to the imagination. The work was a little harder than the corresponding work on the medical side. There was a lecture from nine till ten when he went into the wards. There wounds had to be dressed, stitches taken out, bandages renewed. Philip prided himself a little on his skill in bandaging, and it amused him to wring a word of approval from a nurse. On certain afternoons in the week there were operations, and he stood in the well of the theatre in a white jacket ready to hand the operating surgeon any instrument he wanted or to sponge the blood away so that he could see what he was about. When some rare operation was to be performed the theatre would fill up, but generally there were not more than half a dozen students present, and then the proceedings had a coziness which Philip enjoyed. At that time the world at large seemed to have a passion for appendicitis, and a good many cases came to the operating theatre for this complaint. The surgeon for whom Philip dressed was in friendly rivalry with a colleague as to which could remove an appendix in the shortest time and with the smallest incision. In due course Philip was put on accident duty. The dressers took this in turn. It lasted three days, during which they lived in hospital and ate their meals in the common room. They had a room on the ground floor near the casualty ward, with a bed that shut up during the day into a cupboard. The dresser on duty had to be at hand day and night to see to any casualty that came in. You were on the move all the time, and not more than an hour or two passed during the night without the clanging of the bell just above your head which made you leap out of bed instinctively. Saturday night was, of course, the busiest time, and the closing of the public houses the busiest hour. Men would be brought in by the police dead drunk and it would be necessary to administer a stomach pump. Women, rather the worse for liquor themselves, would come in with a wound on the head or a bleeding nose which their husbands had given them. Some would vow to have the law on him, and others, ashamed, would declare that it had been an accident. What the dresser could manage himself he did, but if there was anything important he sent for the house surgeon. He did this with care, since the house-surgeon was not vastly pleased to be dragged down five flights of stairs for nothing. The cases ranged from a cut finger to a cut throat. Boys came in with hands mangled by some machine, men were brought who had been knocked down by a cab, and children who had broken a limb while playing. Now and then attempted suicides were carried in by the police. Philip saw a ghastly, wild-eyed man with a great gash from ear to ear, and he was in the ward for weeks afterward in charge of a constable, silent, angry because he was alive, and sullen. He made no secret of the fact that he would try again to kill himself as soon as he was released. The wards were crowded, and the house-surgeon was faced with a dilemma when patients were brought in by the police. If they were sent on to the station and died there, Disagreeable things were said in the papers, and it was very difficult sometimes to tell if a man was dying or drunk. Philip did not go to bed till he was tired out, so that he should not have the bother of getting up again in an hour, and he sat in the casualty ward talking in the intervals of work with the night nurse. She was a grey-haired woman of masculine appearance who had been night nurse in the casualty department for twenty years. She liked the work because she was her own mistress and had no sister to bother her. Her movements were slow, but she was immensely capable, and she never failed in an emergency. The dressers, often inexperienced or nervous, found her a tower of strength. She had seen thousands of them, and they made no impression upon her. She always called them Mr. Brown, and when they expostulated and told her their real names she merely nodded and went on calling them Mr. Brown. It interested Philip to sit with her in the bare room with its two horsehair couches and the flaring gas, and listen to her. She had long ceased to look upon the people who came in as human beings. They were drunks, or broken arms, or cut throats. She took the vice and misery and cruelty of the world as a matter of course. She found nothing to praise or blame in human actions. She accepted. 
she had a certain grim humour. "'I remember one suicide,' she said to Philip, who threw himself into the Thames. They fished him out and brought him here, and ten days later he developed typhoid fever from swallowing Thames water. "'Did he die?' "'Yes, he did all right. I could never make up my mind if it was suicide or not. They're a funny lot, suicides. I remember one man who couldn't get any work to do and his wife died, so he pawned his clothes and bought a revolver. But he made a mess of it. He only shot out an eye, and he got all right. And then, if you please, with an eye gone and a piece of his face blown away, he came to the conclusion that the world wasn't such a bad place after all, and he lived happily ever afterwards. Thing I've always noticed, people don't commit suicide for love as you'd expect. That's just the fancy of novelists. They commit suicide because they haven't got any money. I wonder why that is. I suppose money's more important than love, suggested Philip. Money was, in any case, occupying Philip's thoughts a good deal just then. He discovered the little truth there was in the airy saying which himself had repeated, that two could live as cheaply as one, and his expenses were beginning to worry him. Mildred was not a good manager, and it cost them as much to live as if they had eaten in restaurants. The child needed clothes and Mildred boots, an umbrella, and other small things which it was impossible for her to do without. When they returned from Brighton she had announced her intention of getting a job, but she took no definite steps, and presently a bad cold laid her up for a fortnight. When she was well she answered one or two advertisements, but nothing came of it. Either she arrived too late and the vacant place was filled, or the work was more than she felt strong enough to do. Once she got an offer, but the wages were only fourteen shillings a week, and she thought she was worth more than that. "'It's no good letting oneself be put upon,' she remarked. "'People don't respect you if you let yourself go too cheap.' "'I don't think fourteen shillings is so bad.' answered Philip dryly. He could not help thinking how useful it would be towards the expenses of the household, and Mildred was already beginning to hint that she did not get a place because she had not got a decent dress to interview employers in. He gave her the dress, and she made one or two more attempts, but Philip came to the conclusion that they were not serious. She did not want to work. The only way he knew to make money was on the stock exchange and he was very anxious to repeat the lucky experiment of the summer. But war had broken out with the Transvaal, and nothing was doing in South Africans. McAllister told him that Redvers Butler would march into Pretoria in a month, and then everything would boom. The only thing was to wait patiently. What they wanted was a British reverse to knock things down a bit, and then it might be worthwhile buying. Philip began reading assiduously the city chat of his favorite newspaper. He was worried and irritable. Once or twice he spoke sharply to Mildred, and since she was neither tactful nor patient she answered with temper, and they quarreled. Philip always expressed his regret for what he had said, but Mildred had not a forgiving nature, and she would sulk for a couple of days. She got on his nerves in all sorts of ways, by the manner in which she ate, and by the untidiness which made her leave articles of clothing about their sitting-room. Philip was excited by the war and devoured the papers morning and evening, but she took no interest in anything that happened. She had made the acquaintance of two or three people who lived in the street, and one of them had asked if she would like the curate to call on her. She wore a wedding ring and called herself Mrs. Carey. On Philip's walls were two or three of the drawings which he had made in Paris, nudes, two of the women, and one of Miguel Ahura standing very square on his feet with clenched fists. Philip kept them because they were the best things he had done, and they reminded him of happy days. Mildred had long looked at them with disfavor. "'I wish you'd take those drawings down, Philip,' she said to him at last. "'Mrs. Foreman of number 13 came in yesterday afternoon, and I didn't know which way to look. I saw her staring at them.' "'What's the matter with them?' They're indecent, disgusting, that's what I call it, to have drawings of naked people about. And it isn't nice for Baby, either. She's beginning to notice things now. How can you be so vulgar? Vulgar? Modest, I call it. I've never said anything, but do you think I like having to look at those naked people all day long? 
"'Have you no sense of humor at all, Mildred?' he asked frigidly. "'I don't know what sense of humor's got to do with it. I've got a good mind to take them down myself. If you want to know what I think about them, I think they're disgusting.' "'I don't want to know what you think about them, and I forbid you to touch them.' When Mildred was cross with him, she punished him through the baby. The little girl was as fond as Philip as he was of her, and it was her great pleasure every morning to crawl into his room, she was getting on for two now and could walk pretty well, and be taken up into his bed. When Mildred stopped this, the poor child would cry bitterly. To Philip's remonstrances she replied, "'I don't want her to get into habits.' And if then he said anything more, she said, "'It's nothing to do with you what I do with my child. To hear you talk you would think you was her father. I'm her mother, and I ought to know what's good for her, aren't I?' Philip was exasperated by Mildred's stupidity. But he was so indifferent to her now that it was only at times she made him angry. He grew used to having her about. Christmas came, and with it a couple of days' holiday for Philip. He brought some holly in and decorated the flat, and on Christmas Day he gave small presents to Mildred and the baby. There were only two of them so they could not have a turkey, but Mildred roasted a chicken and boiled a Christmas pudding which she had bought at the local grocer's. They stood themselves a bottle of wine. When they had dined Philip sat in his armchair by the fire smoking his pipe, and the unaccustomed wine had made him forget for a while the anxiety about money which was so constantly with him. He felt happy and comfortable. Presently Mildred came in to tell him that the baby wanted him to kiss her good night, and with a smile he went into Mildred's bedroom. Then, telling the child to go to sleep, he turned down the gas and, leaving the door open in case she cried, went back into the sitting room. "'Where are you going to sit?' he asked Mildred. "'You sit in your chair. I'm going to sit on the floor.' When he sat down she settled herself in front of the fire and leaned against his knees. He could not help remembering that this was how they had sat together in her rooms in the Vauxhall Bridge Road, but the positions had been reversed. It was he who had sat on the floor and leaned his head against her knee. How passionately he had loved her then! Now he felt for her a tenderness he had not known for a long time. He seemed still to feel twined round his neck the baby's soft little arms. "'Are you comfy?' he asked. She looked up at him, gave a slight smile, and nodded. They gazed into the fire dreamily without speaking to one another. At last she turned round and stared at him curiously. "'Do you know that you haven't kissed me once since I came here?' she said suddenly. "'Do you want me to?' he smiled. "'I suppose you don't care for me in that way any more?' "'I'm very fond of you.' "'You're much fonder of baby.' He did not answer, and she laid her cheek against his hand. "'You're not angry with me any more?' she asked presently, with her eyes cast down. "'Why on earth should I be?' "'I've never cared for you as I do now. It's only since I've passed through the fire that I've learnt to love you. It chilled Philip to hear her make use of the sort of phrase she read in the penny novelettes which she devoured. Then he wondered whether what she said had any meaning for her. Perhaps she knew no other way to express her genuine feelings than the stilted language of the family herald. It seems so funny our living together like this. He did not reply for quite a long time, and silence fell upon them again, but at last he spoke and seemed conscious of no interval. "'You mustn't be angry with me. One can't help these things. I remember that I thought you wicked and cruel because you did this, that, and the other. But it was very silly of me. You didn't love me, and it was absurd to blame you for that. I thought I could make you love me, but I know now that was impossible. I don't know what it is that makes someone love you, but whatever it is, it's the only thing that matters and if it isn't there you won't create it by kindness or generosity or anything of that sort. I should have thought if you'd loved me really you'd have loved me still. I should have thought so too. I remember how I used to think that it would last forever. I felt I would rather die than be without you, and I used to long for the time when you would be faded and wrinkled so that nobody cared for you any more and I should have you all to myself. 
She did not answer, and presently she got up and said she was going to bed. She gave a timid little smile. "'It's Christmas Day, Philip. Won't you kiss me good night?' He gave a laugh, blushed slightly, and kissed her. She went to her bedroom, and he began to read. End of chapter 95 Chapter 96 The climax came two or three weeks later. Mildred was driven by Philip's behavior to a pitch of strange exasperation. There were many different emotions in her soul, and she passed from mood to mood with facility. She spent a great deal of time alone and brooded over her position. She did not put all her feelings into words, she did not even know what they were, but certain things stood out in her mind, and she thought of them over and over again. She had never understood Philip, nor had very much liked him, but she was pleased to have him about her because she thought he was a gentleman. She was impressed because his father had been a doctor and his uncle was a clergyman. She despised him a little because she had made such a fool of him and at the same time was never quite comfortable in his presence. She could not let herself go, and she felt that he was criticizing her manners. When she first came to live in the little rooms in Kennington she was tired out and ashamed. She was glad to be left alone. It was a comfort to think that there was no rent to pay. She need not go out in all weathers, and she could lie quietly in bed if she did not feel well she had hated the life she led. It was horrible to have to be affable and subservient, and even now when it crossed her mind she cried with pity for herself as she thought of the roughness of men and their brutal language, but it crossed her mind very seldom. She was grateful to Philip for coming to her rescue, and when she remembered how honestly he had loved her and how badly she had treated him she felt a pang of remorse. It was easy to make it up to him. It meant very little to her. She was surprised when he refused her suggestion, but she shrugged her shoulders. Let him put on airs if he liked. She did not care. He would be anxious enough in a little while, and then it would be her turn to refuse. If he thought it was any deprivation to her, he was very much mistaken. She had no doubt of her power over him. He was peculiar, but she knew him through and through. He had so often quarreled with her and sworn he would never see her again, and then in a little while he had come on his knees begging to be forgiven. It gave her a thrill to think how he had cringed before her. He would have been glad to lie down on the ground for her to walk on him. She had seen him cry. She knew exactly how to treat him, pay no attention to him, just pretend you didn't notice his tempers, leave him severely alone, and in a little while he was sure to grovel. She laughed a little to herself good-humouredly when she thought how he had come and eaten dirt before her. She had had her fling now. She knew what men were and did not want to have anything more to do with them. She was quite ready to settle down with Philip. When all was said he was a gentleman in every sense of the word, and that was something not to be sneezed at wasn't it? Anyhow, she was in no hurry, and she was not going to take the first step. She was glad to see how fond he was growing of the baby, though it tickled her a good deal. It was comic that he should set so much store on another man's child. He was peculiar, and no mistake. But one or two things surprised her. She had been used to his subservience. He was only too glad to do anything for her in the old days, she was accustomed to see him cast down by a cross word and in ecstasy at a kind one. He was different now, and she said to herself that he had not improved in the last year. It never struck her for a moment that there could be any change in his feelings, and she thought it was only acting when he paid no heed to her bad temper. He wanted to read sometimes and told her to stop talking. She did not know whether to flare up or to sulk, and was so puzzled that she did neither. Then came the conversation in which he told her that he intended their relations to be platonic, and, remembering an incident of their common past, it occurred to her that he dreaded the possibility of her being pregnant. She took pains to reassure him. It made no difference. She was the sort of woman who was unable to realize that a man might not have her own obsession with sex. 
her relations with men had been purely on those lines, and she could not understand that they ever had other interests. The thought struck her that Philip was in love with somebody else, and she watched him, suspecting nurses at the hospital or people he met out. But artful questions led her to the conclusion that there was no one dangerous in the Athelny household and it forced itself upon her also that Philip, like most medical students, was unconscious of the sex of the nurses with whom his work threw him in contact. They were associated in his mind with a faint odor of iodoform. Philip received no letters, and there was no girl's photograph among his belongings. If he was in love with someone, he was very clever at hiding it, and he answered all Mildred's questions with frankness, and apparently without suspicion that there was any motive in them. "'I don't believe he's in love with anybody else,' she said to herself at last. It was a relief, for in that case he was certainly still in love with her, but it made his behavior very puzzling. If he was going to treat her like that, why did he ask her to come and live at the flat? It was unnatural. Mildred was not a woman who conceived the possibility of compassion, generosity, or kindness. Her only conclusion was that Philip was queer. She took it into her head that the reasons for his conduct were chivalrous, and, her imagination filled with the extravagances of cheap fiction, she pictured to herself all sorts of romantic explanations for his delicacy. Her fancy ran riot with bitter misunderstandings, purifications by fire, snow-white souls, and death in the cruel cold of a Christmas night. She made up her mind that when they went to Brighton she would put an end to all his nonsense. They would be alone there, everyone would think them husband and wife, and there would be the pier and the band. When she found that nothing would induce Philip to share the same room with her, when he spoke to her about it with a tone in his voice she had never heard before, she suddenly realized that he did not want her. She was astounded. She remembered all he had said in the past and how desperately he had loved her. She felt humiliated and angry, but she had a sort of native insolence which carried her through. He needn't think she was in love with him, because she wasn't. She hated him sometimes, and she longed to humble him, but she found herself singularly powerless. She did not know which way to handle him. She began to be a little nervous with him. Once or twice she cried. Once or twice she set herself to be particularly nice to him, but when she took his arm while they walked along at night he made some excuse in a while to release himself, as though it were unpleasant for him to be touched by her. She could not make it out. The only hold she had over him was through the baby, of whom he seemed to grow fonder and fonder. She could make him white with anger by giving the child a slap or a push and the only time the old tender smile came back into his eyes was when she stood with the baby in her arms. She noticed it when she was being photographed like that by a man on the beach, and afterwards she often stood in the same way for Philip to look at her. When they got back to London Mildred began looking for the work she had asserted was so easy to find. She wanted now to be independent of Philip, and she thought of the satisfaction with which she would announce to him that she was going into rooms and would take the child with her. But her heart failed her when she came into closer contact with the possibility. She had grown unused to the long hours. She did not want to be at the beck and call of a manageress, and her dignity revolted at the thought of wearing once more a uniform. She had made out to such of the neighbors as she knew that they were comfortably off. It would be a come-down if they heard that she had to go out and work. Her natural indolence asserted itself. She did not want to leave Philip, and so long as he was willing to provide for her, she did not see why she should. There was no money to throw away, but she got her board and lodging, and he might get better off. His uncle was an old man and might die any day. He would come into a little then and even as things were it was better than slaving from morning till night for a few shillings a week. Her efforts relaxed. She kept on reading the advertisement columns of the daily paper merely to show that she wanted to do something if anything that was worth her while presented itself. But panic seized her, and she was afraid that Philip would grow tired of supporting her. She had no hold over him at all now. 
and she fancied that he only allowed her to stay there because he was fond of the baby. She brooded over it all, and she thought to herself angrily that she would make him pay for all this some day. She could not reconcile herself to the fact that he no longer cared for her. She would make him. She suffered from pique, and sometimes in a curious fashion she desired Philip. He was so cold now that it exasperated her. She thought of him in that way incessantly. She thought that he was treating her very badly, and she did not know what she had done to deserve it. She kept on saying to herself that it was unnatural they should live like that. Then she thought that if things were different and she were going to have a baby, he would be sure to marry her. He was funny, but he was a gentleman in every sense of the word. No one could deny that. At last it became an obsession with her, and she made up her mind to force a change in their relations. He never even kissed her now, and she wanted him to. She remembered how ardently he had been used to press her lips. It gave her a curious feeling to think of it. She often looked at his mouth. One evening, at the beginning of February, Philip told her that he was dining with Lawson, who was giving a party in his studio to celebrate his birthday and he would not be in till late. Lawson had bought a couple of bottles of the punch they favored from the tavern in Beak Street, and they proposed to have a merry evening. Mildred asked if there were going to be women there, but Philip told her there were not. Only men had been invited, and they were just going to sit and talk and smoke. Mildred did not think it sounded very amusing. If she were a painter she would have half a dozen models about. She went to bed but could not sleep and presently an idea struck her. She got up and fixed the catch on the wicket at the landing so that Philip could not get in. He came back about one, and she heard him curse when he found that the wicket was closed. She got out of bed and opened. "'Why on earth did you shut yourself in? I'm sorry I've dragged you out of bed. I left it open on purpose. I can't think how it came to be shut. Hurry up and get back to bed, or you'll catch cold.' He walked into the sitting-room and turned up the gas. She followed him in. She went up to the fire. "'I want to warm my feet a bit. They're like ice.' He sat down and began to take off his boots. His eyes were shining and his cheeks were flushed. She thought he had been drinking. "'Have you been enjoying yourself?' she asked with a smile. "'Yes, I've had a ripping time.' Philip was quite sober, but he had been talking and laughing, and he was excited still. An evening of that sort reminded him of the old days in Paris. He was in high spirits. He took his pipe out of his pocket and filled it. "'Aren't you going to bed?' she asked. "'Not yet. I'm not a bit sleepy. Lawson was in great form. He talked sixteen to the dozen from the moment I got there till the moment I left.' "'What did you talk about?' "'Oh, heaven knows. Of every subject under the sun, you should have seen us all shouting at the tops of our voices and nobody listening. Philip laughed with pleasure at the recollection, and Mildred laughed too. She was pretty sure he had drunk more than was good for him. That was exactly what she had expected. She knew men. "'Can I sit down?' she said. Before he could answer she settled herself on his knees. "'If you're not going to bed you'd better go and put on a dressing gown. Oh, I'm all right as I am.' Then, putting her arms round his neck, she placed her face against his and said, "'Why are you so horrid to me, Phil?' He tried to get up, but she would not let him. "'I do love you, Philip,' she said. "'Don't talk damned rot.' "'It isn't. It's true. I can't live without you. I want you.' He released himself from her arms. "'Please get up. You're making a fool of yourself, and you're making me feel a perfect idiot. I love you, Philip. I want to make up for all the harm I did you. I can't go on like this. It's not in human nature." He slipped out of the chair and left her in it. "'I'm very sorry, but it's too late.' She gave a heart-rendering sob. "'But why? How can you be so cruel?' "'I suppose it's because I loved you too much. I wore the passion out. The thought of anything of that sort horrifies me. I can't look at you now without thinking of Emil and Griffiths. One can't help those things. I suppose it's just nerves. She seized his hand and covered it with kisses. Don't, he cried. She sank back into the chair. I can't go on like this. If you won't love me, I'd rather go away. 
don't be foolish you haven't anywhere to go you can stay here as long as you like but it must be on the definite understanding that we're friends and nothing more then she dropped suddenly the vehemence of passion and gave a soft insinuating laugh she sidled up to philip and put her arms round him she made her voice low and wheedling don't be such an old silly i believe you're nervous you don't know how nice i can be she put her face against his and rubbed his cheek with hers to philip her smile was an abominable leer and the suggestive glitter of her eyes filled him with horror he drew back instinctively i won't he said but she would not let him go she sought his mouth with her lips he took her hands and tore them roughly apart and pushed her away you disgust me he said me she steadied herself with one hand on the chimney-piece she looked at him for an instant and two red spots suddenly appeared on her cheeks she gave a shrill and angry laugh i disgust you she paused and drew in her breath sharply then she burst into a furious torrent of abuse she shouted at the top of her voice she called him every foul name she could think of she used language so obscene that philip was astounded she was always so anxious to be refined so shocked by coarseness that it had never occurred to him that she knew the word she used now she came up to him and thrust her face in his it was distorted with passion and in her tumultuous speech the spittle dribbled over her lips i never cared for you not once i was making a fool of you always you bored me you bored me stiff and i hated you i would never have let you touch me only for the money and it used to make me sick when i had to let you kiss me we laughed at you griffiths and me we laughed because you was such a mug a mug a mug then she burst again into abominable invective she accused him of every mean fault she said he was stingy she said he was dull she said he was vain selfish she cast virulent ridicule on everything upon which he was most sensitive and at last she turned to go she kept on with hysterical violence shouting at him an opprobrious filthy epithet she seized the handle of the door and flung it open then she turned round and hurled at him the injury which she knew was the only one that really touched him she threw into the word all the malice and all the venom of which she was capable she flung it at him as though it were a blow cripple end of chapter ninety six chapter ninety seven philip awoke with a start next morning conscious that it was late and looking at his watch found it was nine o'clock he jumped out of bed and went into the kitchen to get himself some hot water to shave with there was no sign of mildred and the things which she had used for her supper the night before still lay in the sink unwashed he knocked at her door wake up mildred it's awfully late she did not answer even after a second louder knocking and he concluded that she was sulking he was in too great a hurry to bother about that he put some water on to boil and jumped into his bath which was always poured out the night before in order to take the chill off he presumed that mildred would cook his breakfast while he was dressing and leave it in the sitting-room she had done that two or three times when she was out of temper but he heard no sound of her moving and realized that if he wanted anything to eat he would have to get it himself he was irritated that she should play such a trick on a morning when he had overslept himself. There was still no sign of her when he was ready, but he heard her moving about her room. She was evidently getting up. He made himself some tea and cut himself a couple of pieces of bread and butter, which he ate while he was putting on his boots, then bolted downstairs and along the street into the main road to catch his tram. While his eyes sought out the newspaper shops to see the war news on the placards, he thought of the scene of the night before. Now that it was over and he had slept on it, he could not help thinking it grotesque. He supposed he had been ridiculous, but he was not master of his feelings. At the time they had been overwhelming. He was angry with Mildred because she had forced him into that absurd position, and then with renewed astonishment he thought of her outburst and the filthy language she had used. He could not help flushing when he remembered her final jibe, but he shrugged his shoulders contemptuously. He had long known that when his fellows were angry with him 
they had never failed to taunt him with his deformity. He had seen men at the hospital imitate his walk, not before him as they used to at school, but when they thought he was not looking. He knew now that they did it from no willful unkindness, but because man is naturally an imitative animal, and because it was an easy way to make people laugh. He knew it, but he could never resign himself to it. He was glad to throw himself into his work. The ward seemed pleasant and friendly when he entered it. The sister greeted him with a quick, business-like smile. "'You're very late, Mr. Carey. I was out on the loose last night. You look it. Thank you.' laughing he went to the first of his cases a boy with tuberculosis ulcers and removed his bandages the boy was pleased to see him and philip chaffed him as he put a clean dressing on the wound philip was a favorite with the patients he treated them good-humoredly and he had gentle sensitive hands which did not hurt them some of the dressers were a little rough and happy-go-lucky in their methods he lunched with his friends in the club-room, a frugal meal consisting of a scone and butter with a cup of cocoa, and they talked of the war. Several men were going out, but the authorities were particular and refused everyone who had not had a hospital appointment. Someone suggested that, if the war went on, in a while they would be glad to take anyone who was qualified, but the general opinion was that it would be over in a month. Now that Roberts was there, things would get all right in no time. This was McAllister's opinion, too, and he had told Philip that they must watch their chances and buy just before peace was declared. There would be a boom then, and they might all make a bit of money. Philip had left with McAllister instructions to buy him stock whenever the opportunity presented itself. His appetite had been whetted by the thirty pounds he had made in the summer, and he wanted now to make a couple of hundred. He finished his day's work and got on a tram to go back to Kennington. He wondered how Mildred would behave that evening. It was a nuisance to think that she would probably be surly and refuse to answer his questions. It was a warm evening for the time of year, and even in those grey streets of South London there was a languor of February. Nature is restless then after the long winter months, growing things awake from their sleep, and there is a rustle in the earth a forerunner of spring as it resumes its eternal activities. Philip would have liked to drive on further. It was distasteful to him to go back to his rooms, and he wanted the air, but the desire to see the child clutched suddenly at his heartstrings, and he smiled to himself as he thought of her toddling towards him with the crow of delight. He was surprised when he reached the house and looked up mechanically at the windows to see that there was no light. He went upstairs and knocked, but got no answer. When Mildred went out she left the key under the mat, and he found it there now. He let himself in, and going into the sitting-room, struck a match. Something had happened. He did not at once know what. He turned the gas on full and lit it. The room was suddenly filled with the glare, and he looked round. He gasped. The whole place was wrecked. Everything in it had been willfully destroyed. Anger seized him, and he rushed into Mildred's room. It was dark and empty. When he had got a light he saw that she had taken away all her things and the babies. He had noticed on entering that the go-cart was not in its usual place on the landing, but thought Mildred had taken the baby out. And all the things on the washing-stand had been broken. A knife had been drawn crossways through the seats of the two chairs, the pillow had been slit open, there were large gashes in the sheets and the counterpane, the looking-glass appeared to have been broken with a hammer. Philip was bewildered. He went into his own room, and here too everything was in confusion. The basin and the ewer had been smashed, the looking-glass was in fragments, and the sheets were in ribbons. Mildred had made a slit large enough to put her hand into the pillow, and had scattered the feathers about the room. She had jabbed a knife into the blankets. On the dressing-table were photographs of Philip's mother. The frames had been smashed, and the glass shivered. Philip went into the tiny kitchen. Everything that was breakable was broken. Glasses, pudding bases, plates, dishes. It took Philip's breath away. Mildred had left no letter, nothing but this ruin to mark her anger, and he could imagine the set face with which she had gone about her work. He went back into the sitting-room and looked about him. 
he was so astonished that he no longer felt angry. He looked curiously at the kitchen knife and the coal hammer which were lying on the table where she had left them. Then his eye caught a large carving knife in the fireplace which had been broken. It must have taken her a long time to do so much damage. Lawson's portrait of him had been cut crossways and gaped hideously. His own drawings had been ripped in pieces, and the photographs, Manet's Olympia and Odalis of Angra, the portrait of Philip IV, had been smashed with great blows of the coal hammer. There were gashes in the tablecloth and in the curtains and in the two armchairs. They were quite ruined. On one wall over the table which Philip used as his desk was the little bit of Persian rug which Cronshaw had given him. Mildred had always hated it. "'If it's a rug it ought to go on the floor,' she said, "'and it's a dirty, stinking bit of stuff, that's all it is. It made her furious because Philip told her it contained the answer to a great riddle. She thought he was making fun of her. She had drawn the knife right through it three times. It must have required some strength, and it hung now in tatters. Philip had two or three blue and white plates of no value, but he had bought them one by one for very small sums and liked them for their associations. They littered the floor in fragments. There were long gashes on the backs of his books, and she had taken the trouble to tear pages out of the unbound French ones. The little ornaments on the chimney-piece lay on the hearth in bits. Everything that it had been possible to destroy with a knife or a hammer was destroyed. The whole of Philip's belongings would have not sold for thirty pounds, but most of them were old friends, and he was a domestic creature, attached to all those odds and ends because they were his. He had been proud of his little home, and on so little money had made it pretty and characteristic. He sank down now in despair. He asked himself how she could have been so cruel. A sudden fear got him on his feet again and into the passage where stood a cupboard in which he kept his clothes. He opened it and gave a sigh of relief. She had apparently forgotten it, and none of his things was touched. He went back into the sitting-room and, surveying the scene, wondered what to do. He had not the heart to begin trying to set things straight. Besides, there was no food in the house, and he was hungry. He went out and got himself something to eat. When he came in he was cooler. A little pang seized him as he thought of the child, and he wondered whether she would miss him, at first perhaps, but in a week she would have forgotten him. And he was thankful to be rid of Mildred. He did not think of her with wrath, but with an overwhelming sense of boredom. "'I hope to God I never see her again,' he said aloud. The only thing now was to leave the rooms, and he made up his mind to give notice the next morning. He could not afford to make good the damage done, and he had so little money left that he must find cheaper lodgings still. He would be glad to get out of them. The expense had worried him, and now the recollection of Mildred would be in them always. Philip was impatient and could never rest till he had put in action the plan which he had in mind. So, on the following afternoon, he got in a dealer in second-hand furniture who offered him three pounds for all his goods, damaged and undamaged. And two days later he moved into the house opposite the hospital in which he had had rooms when first he became a medical student. The landlady was a very decent woman. He took a bedroom at the top which she let him have for six shillings a week. It was small and shabby and looked on the yard of the house that backed on to it, but he had nothing now except his clothes and a box of books, and he was glad to lodge so cheaply. End of chapter 97 Recording by 